Hello and welcome to Dungeons and Magi. This is our talk show, Talk Nerdy to Me. In this show, we pick a topic or two, give our opinions. Um, feel free to chime in the chat with your opinions or questions as well. Um, this will unfortunately be our final episode of Talk Nerdy to Me due to lack of interest. Um, if you do want to see more of this type of show um, or something similar, please let us know in the comments. Um, tonight's topic is potpourri, uh, meaning we're going to talk about whatever comes to mind. Um, I have a few topics written down to talk about, but whatever anybody wants to talk about, we can talk about. Um, obviously, you know, if you are familiar with Dungeons and Magi, you know I am Caleb, the Dungeon Master. Um, I have we have Ben here who normally plays Belvis, the Locatha. Hello, everyone. Um, and we have Ethan here who normally plays Argos, the Minotaur Barbarian. Oh, um, is he now? I believe uh, coming in soon, we will also have Chris, who plays Sobek, the white dragonborn paladin. Um, so, um, well, I guess let's get it started off with favorite D&D &D races. Like, Ooh. like favorite conceptually or like, favorite to play as? I'm just curious. Let, let's start with favorite to play as. Favorite to play as? Um, I'm not saying this just because that's what my character is, but I've really had fun with uh, Minotaurs. And I've also had plenty of fun playing Dragonborns as well. Uh, my original concept was to actually be a Dragonborn, but then when I saw that Bakira um, was a Dragonborn and... I, I was like, I don't really want to play another Dragonborn character. And then I'm glad I didn't because that allowed Chris to come in as Sobek. And I was like, oh, man, that would have been really kind of a crowded party. Like, two's, yeah. two's a, you know, two is a couple, three's a crowd type of thing. And we didn't want, we didn't want that. Or at least I didn't want that. So <laughs> we'll say my, um, first, my first ever character was a Dragonborn. I was a Dragonborn my, Druid. Which one was I, that? I forget. That, that was one. before we started playing. Really? Okay. I thought that I that was like oh, my that's... very first ever character playing D anD D was a dragonborn druid. Mine's was a shifter from the three point five edition, uh, and I was a rogue because uh, I had literally had no idea what I was doing and was playing down at my local card shop. And luckily, the guy, the card shop owner, Chris, if you're watching, um, he uh, he took care of he took care of me, got me set up, and then about literally like three and a half to four hours into the into my very first uh, campaign session, I got critical hit when I had two hit points left. <laughs> I actually stopped that stopped my dragonborn to be a permanent dm um <laughs> i i i would ahead. say my favorite character of my favorite one to play as race i i mean i don't think i have a specific one Hon honestly any other care any race besides a human I, and it's Actually, just, i just i just i love the idea when when you're you know if i'm going to commit to Make believe, you know, gosh darn it, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go all all the way, you know. Andy's about being you remember my you can't be. I mean my first character was first ever character <laughs> I created was uh a freaking uh birdman. Eric Cockra. Eric Eric Cockra drew it and I couldn't and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Nope. That is the one race I don't think I'll ever see me play as as an Eric Cockra. It's I, not uh, bad, I honestly. Like, I I think it's because it's one of those sh it's one of those like races that so many DMs ban at their table, and then also like I don't know like I like there's other appeals to other races, and so, Caleb's probably gonna ask a, a this, lot of but. a lot of DMs ban the Aarakocra simply because of the flight ability. 
a lot of well, times, I, don't I like, barely use I barely use, use arrows. A lot a lot of them use don't it. don't like the flight ability, which is so like I obviously you guys know I'm pretty open to I let you guys play pretty much whatever you want. I do have some restrictions like um and this will lead into class later, um, like a necromancer. Mm-hmm. In this world, um in the world that I've created, necromancy is outlawed. So that is the one thing you can play it, but it's not going to end well if you get caught kind of thing. Um, well, and that's, and that's not something that like, I guess it's not even banned. Like you're not banning it. You're just saying here are the applications yeah, or the, like, this is what's going to happen. Here's the And that's just a fair warning. That's yeah. like, All that's right. a fair warning. I feel like that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Like people would, although I, I, at, I must, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Ben. No, I, I must say though, Caleb, if some if we ever do dabble into necromancy, you must recreate the witch scene in Monty Python. You <laughs> have to. I demand. I, comedy demands it. Um, What's Monty Python? Oh, oh no. God. Um, if for for those of you who don't know, I lived under a rock that was underneath a boulder that was in a like dug seven feet down into Mon- a hole. That was the. Yeah. Monty Scope Python is what they should show in every history class to teach every you about medieval times. Because yeah, it is probably as accurate as you can get to medieval times. Just kidding. Please witch. don't show that in history no. class. Oh. Um, wait, wait, no, no, please show it in history class. I mean, yeah, I mean it'll it, get to be honest, that's what got me interested in history. My it was Monty Python was my grandfather and my father my grandfather rest in peace. Um and my father's favorite movies, and that's what made, got me interested in history and spoiler alert i um just applied to go back to school to major in history and minor in uh archaeology and anthropology so uh um, what happened to the what happened to the medieval languages oh it's included because i'm i'm focusing mm. on uh european and medieval mm. during the history so that it's actually included in my major um but so my favorite clock, my favorite race, if you can see him right there. I knew it. Is Goliath. Goliath. Um, for those of you that have not seen it, um, go take a look at some of our other videos. The Specifically the um, Scarlet, Scarlet Brigade, Brigade videos. <laughs> that is where Ethan <sighs> actually took the role of a DM and I got to play as my favorite character I've ever, ever created, Maresh. The Goliath Barbarian, um, the one who overthrew the kingdom I created and cr- and became king, and then yeah, that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't by design, just FYI. No, it was not. But um, <laughs> I I don't know what it this is. What happens I, so when I leave them I, alone? I, I will be honest that um, Critical Role is what I I played D and D a little bit um growing up, but Critical Role is really what got me into D and D. Um, if God, if you guys ever see this, Matt, Travis, everybody, if you guys ever see this, it is, you are the reason that I am here. To be honest, you're the reason Dungeons and Magi exist. Uh, you're the reason I wanted to mm-hmm. create this. Um, but I absolutely fell in love with Grog. Grog was my favorite thing. <laughs> Travis and I share a similar background in real life, starting in sports and then getting into musical theater and all of that and kind of being shunned because of being in musical theater. Um, that was – so we have a similar background, so Travis and I connect in that aspect. And then I just fell in love with Grog, and I decided to create a character that was Grog-esque. I'm actually, a little, I'm actually smarter than Grog. Um, my intelligence is higher. Uh, oh, yeah. Because he can read and write. Um, I mean, he, ro- oh. he rules a kingdom, but uh, you'd be surprised how many illiterate kings there were. But yes, the the Goliath. I don't. I don't know what it is. It's just a big, bulky, and being a barbarian. I mean, ask Ethan how 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 sick and tired he was of me dealing that much damage. Um, put it this way. What, I think, it purposely what, one threw round I did 200. Put it this yeah. way. I threw I threw three legendary beasts at this group. 
three legendary beasts. I threw a Trask. I threw an ancient red dragon, and I threw a purple worm all at this group. Of the three, the ancient red dragon was the only one that actually managed to keep up with the group, but that's because it had breath weapon, and it also had the ability to uh, take legendary actions to if it got hit, it can make a tail attack. And so every time Maresh would hit me with the axe, he got tail swiped, essentially. And so it was kind of like, okay, who's going to... So literally, I think I think Caleb pointed this out. It was kind of like, who's going to beat the other one down first, the dragon or Maresh? And it like literally came into a like kind of like a blow-for-blow blow battle. Um, but I will say that the Ancient Red Dragon was the only one that put up a fight. The Tarrasque... We're not even going to go into the Tarrasque. Like, not literally or figuratively, but like it kind of broke my heart because I was like, man, the Trask, I get to use it. I get to picture, I picture this epic battle where the heroes are like, you know, oh man, we got to fight this guy off. And what happened? I like critically failed three of my like knowledge saving or like wisdom saving throws and it got stunned and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to give you all a little bit of background before we, the first session that includes this, I believe the Scarlet Brigade. I wrote when I was in army training, and you and I, I wrote that in an afternoon. This is a one shot. I forget why we were doing a one shot, but you, you, I think you just said, "Hey, I need a one shot from you tonight." Hey, um, go. I didn't have the time because at the time I had. So was that when you moved? For, no. Um, No, because I'm pretty so thought, sure I was. I thought, I'm pretty sure I was still there when we did the f- the first one shot. I was at the apartment still. Yeah, um, and I wasn't. No, I was there. I was there. You I, were. You were the kobold. You were the kobold. I was the kobold. I forgot. So, I, I, so, I think what it was is I needed time to write for the next session because for those that don't yes, know, that's right. I at the beginning of this, I actually we started out in a place called Talamar. Um, which I and I don't know this because I didn't come in till correct Caleb. So we started off in Talamar um, with the original group, um, and I wrote all of this stuff. And me being a new DM, I rushed them through it. They reached everywhere in Talamar that there was to go, and they leveled up rather quickly. Um, <laughs> And then I hit a point where there was nowhere else to go. I felt like the story was getting stale. There wasn't anything to do. So I ended up creating a new world that instead of stopping the campaign and putting you guys doing new characters and all of that, I decided to just transition you to another part of this planet. Um, Because if you remember, we did find out we are not on Earth. Um, we are in, I transitioned you guys to another part of the planet that is a lot bigger. Um, and we're going to, we're kind of taking it slow. So as it sits right now, I am writing week to week, um, while also writing campaign two for those Mm -hmm. of you watching campaign two is being written. Um, but now we're kind of slowing down a little bit. They're, they're at level 16 now. They're going to be sitting there for at least five or six more sessions before moving up. We're going to kind of slow it down. Um, Just, and to be honest, mostly so I can write campaign two and make campaign two what it's worth. Um, I have figured out a new way to write. Thanks to watching some videos. Um, And so I'm writing this differently. So hopefully campaign two turns out a lot better, a lot more threads to pull. Um, and I'm interested, and this is going to transition into the next topic. I'm interested to see what everybody picks for campaign two, because um, for those Ooh. of you that for those of you that have obviously we just started um, really quote unquote televising our stuff pretty recently, so you guys didn't get to see it from the beginning. Um, but for most people in the in the campaign, this is their third character. Um, besides Bakira, Bakira is the only one of the original group 
um, before they got the name Miseries in, before they got all of that, they are part of the original. She was part of the original group. Um, and I pretty much had a TPK. The only reason I didn't have a TPK, to be honest, and I'll tell you guys this now, even though I didn't do that, is I held back to not kill Bakira. <laughs> I I was power word killing everybody, and then it was only Bakira left, and I decided to not power word kill Bakira. Um, otherwise, Bakira would have died too. But so I'm hoping the next campaign we have the characters a little bit longer if not the whole session i mean if one or two dies it's part of the game but i'm very interested to see what everybody picks for the next campaign leading into i'm one i you already know what i'm going to be using class (laughs) what's everybody's favorite class to play or what is the class you want to play that you haven't played yet or both Bard. Really? I would not have picked Ben to ever, because, ever, ever, now, ever pick Bard. Do not, please, please don't give away your character because I want nope. it to be a surprise. But the, <laughs> Ben and Ben told me about this character. I helped, I helped talk him through some stuff, but this is, it's a great build for a character. It, it, um, one thing you all, all know about me and Ethan, you probably, you guys know this. I like to, when I create a character, I try to make them believable, but I like to kind of, I guess the word is subvert your expectations. Like I, I will, like with Belvis, I picked a fish to be a fighter. You know, everybody expects a fish to be, nobody would expect a fish to be, you know, essentially. Like your Salik, your first character, was an Aarakocka druid. That's kind of it's a bird and it's a druid. It kind of goes hand in hand. It did. It it made sense to Just me. Like the roles. Maresh, Goliath, barbarian. Yeah, the roles for Salik were were well, not my best, <laughs> and so I, I kind of played him as is. Like he's just a socially awkward bird person who lives who lives on a mountain. And I, you know, I'm just horrible at voices. I ended up just be like, I'll just be bird person from Brick and Morty, and I ended up just causing more chaos than I than doing anything. I was probably the most disentuned with nature that any druid that ever was. I but will, I was. Uh, I will say I Bel- I like Belvis a lot better than Salik. I think, and this is the other thing. I think that. Everybody's second character is always better. I agree. Because uh, you, you usually get the feel for, like, your first character is, okay, this is new, what am I going to do? And then the second, especially if you're new to D&D, mostly. If you're new to D&D, like, for pretty much everybody in the campaign, aside from myself, uh, Ethan, um, I believe Elliot's played a little bit, um, and, um, my dad, Aaron, um, aside from that, this is everybody's first time playing D and I, I will admit I used to make fun of the people in high school who made D and D who played D and I wasn't a bully. I wasn't some jock or anything. I just looked at D and D and thought this is silly. Fantasy is silly. It's all elves, dwarves and mages with funny hats and speaking is thou. I thought it was like a combination of, of, you know, medieval times, rent fair and a bunch of other stupid stuff. And look at and you now. The yep. COO of a Dungeons and Dragons company. Oh, if only the computer teacher in my high school could see me now. <laughs> he, he, he was the DM, the guy, he ran the D and D club. He was the DM. Um, Ethan, what is a class you haven't played that you want to play? Um, because I already have a class lined up, which you might you might already have an inkling, but it's in this current campaign. If Argos bites the dust, this is my backup. But if we're going to a new campaign, here's a shocker for you. Uh, I'm thinking Tempest Cleric. Okay. okay. Um. I was kind of talking to Lily about it a little bit. Um, if like, if she liked it, 
and overall, like I've noticed the last few sessions, like the last, not like with Argos, but like um, I played Argos, who's a frontline fighter. I played Picasso, who's a frontline fighter. And I tried to make Tree a frontline fighter. And, and I found true. myself going like, and so, and so my, funny, funny enough, my re- we, before Picasso and before I even thought about um, having you bring Darling back, I thought about bringing Tree back for the one, for the, this last session. We, we could have, we, that would have been hilarious. But I mean, but then we thought he's, of he's supposed to be dead, but yes. I haven't actually confirmed that he's dead. Right. So you still have power in that way, but um, I always have power. Yes, you do, because you're the DM. But, um, so what I noticed is that I've tried to take classes and be the frontline fighters. And I'm like, while that's not a bad idea, like, I like playing frontline fighters, I also don't play enough support characters. Back, like, support characters. So, like, it's going to be a little bit of a change, which I'm hoping Caleb and, like, Ben and Aaron and like the rest of the cast and crew can help me out when I tra- when I come back because we know our gods isn't coming back the same and mm. it's going to be <laughs> more or less different and so I'm hoping that if mostly I get some more. time mostly more but yeah um, but that will hopefully change my play style up enough for me to want to play like this Tempest Cleric idea I have bustling around now is it going to be my favorite race I don't think so um, I have a couple ideas for a race because um, another concept I thought about running with is a female tiefling. Um, I understand one of the previous uh, casts or one of the cast previous characters was a tiefling. Safi. And I, Safi right. was. That is the one we are getting little bits and pieces of from Willow is the her <laughs> female tiefling bard. So, ooh. Which was actually Hang the on. first death ever. Yes. Pam is still not over that. Th- thanks to Pam. Yes. Um, okay, but, I don't want to like ask her about it or like if this brings up bad memories or oh no, whatnot. It's, it's funny. It's, but, it's, it's funny. But, it's so, okay. But, I, uh, I will, how did, how did, how did Safi you. die? Because I came after yes. Safi. Yes, yes, like, I literally so, came in and you guys were literally plunging me out of Argos's first attempt at when he lost his soul. Okay, so... What happened was they were actually going to meet. Um, they this was the original party. This was Hyalthrum, which was my dad's character. He was a Asimar paladin. Um, let's see, we had Salik, the Eric Hawker druid. We had oh, what was Pam's character? Singe. Oh, Singe, Singe was that's a fire right. Genasi sorcerer. Yes. Um, we had Safi, the Tiefling Bard, obviously Bakira. What oh, was Chris's first one? Chris? Oh, what did Chris I have? I don't remember Why? Chris's first one. We'll have to ask him when he comes in, because he's supposed to be in. Um, we'll ask him when he comes in what his first one was, because I don't remember. Um, and so they were going, they were tasked to go find, uh, they didn't know it at the time, but another Aarakocra. Um, there was a bounty put out on his head that they were collecting. Um, and they end up finding him up, uh, in the mountains. Um, and there were a lot of puzzles, probably the greatest puzzles I've ever created. Um, there was a symbol, there were symbols on the floor of different gods and their elements. And then there were bowls that corresponded with these elements. Well, the the goal was to figure out something that they had on them or that they could find that would take place of these elements, that they put them in the bowls, the bowl lights up, they get all of them, the doors open. Or the actually the floor opened. Um, well, what happened was one of the gods, which I'll have to go back and look at what it was, but one of the gods, the symbol was hands tied with rope around it okay well, my goal was for somebody to just take the rope because everybody typically has rope in their inventory and put it inside the bowl and that was going to work well pam uh singe decides to take and tie safi's hands and put safi's hands in the bowl 
Oh no. And so yeah. I was like, uh, what do I do? Okay. I said, Safi roll a dexterity saving throw. Natural <laughs> one. Yep. So a blade came out and stabbed Safi in the stomach automatic. Since it was a crit, it was an automatic, uh, two, uh, failed death saves. Um, and then they, they were all freaking out and Pam, we had no cleric then either. There was no cleric. So there was nobody, the closest you had was y'all, but y'all didn't have anything to stabilize. So I made Safi roll another death saving throw and rolled a one. Ooh. And Sometimes Safi died just... right there. Um, yep. I remember that night. Gosh. But yeah, that was because I first think that was ever. Because I was thinking, wasn't that the first week I like messaged you about joining the campaign? Yes. Yeah. Was the night that Safi died because you said because I think you messaged me. I'll have to go back and read to the DMs, but um, uh, I thought you said at one point you said, "Man, I just had a a PC die tonight. It was rough or something like that." Oh yeah. Like. And so, like, and I was like, oh, and so that I think that's what originally drew me to uh, Dungeons and Magi was because I was like, here's a DM that actually cares. Like, just saying that most DMs don't care about when their player characters die. Um, but like, you cared like enough that no, like, man, it was rough for the cast to go through because this was a character that didn't expect to die and just yeah, died. But I um, think. I sorry to cut my time here short, but I had some other stuff that I need to get done before uh, my wife gets off of work. So um, I will step away. If you guys are still on, I will be more than happy to rejoin later. But as of right, right now, I must say goodbye for a little bit. So all right. But hopefully that gives you guys clue into Campaign Two's new character. Yes. All right. See you guys in a little while. Um, and then there were two. Yes, until Chris joins us at some point. So he's going to be a little bit late. But, I saw um, that. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a mark of a good DM when he take, when you, when they take the, into consideration it's not the, the development of their player's characters. Like, for me, like, to me, I take my character development very seriously. It, it, not just in D and D, but also in other games. You saw how I've you've seen me in other games. We've RP'd in how I've just I've taken characters and I just you know kind of develop them over there. And then uh, how I mean I don't like to think of myself as one of the one of those guys who gets like like you you will not destroy my my character arc. But we've seen a couple of the people in Star Wars who tried to mess with my main characters like a little journey as it were just because they thought it'd be funny and it's like step back yeah i so delving into a class obviously i'm the forever dm um but the one shots that we do um i've obviously i've played a barbarian um i've played a warlock um, the one I haven't played that I think I want to play is a monk. I've been, I, I've also had interest in it. I've, just, I've always steered away from religious characters so, other okay. than, other than this, what I just done in so, the, in the Western one. So the monk, that's the thing about the monk. So, and that, that is the stigma of the monk and why a lot of people, Steer clear because if they want religious, they're, they are going to go cleric or paladin. But the monk, especially depending on the way that you choose, meaning the subclass, um, they do not have to be religious at all. If we go into – if we delve into critical role a little bit, you have Beauregard uh, played by Marisha Ray um, who is – the monk uh way of the cobalt soul um not religious at all actually uh lesbian um or bi nobody was really sure one of the two mm. um bad mouthed didn't give a shit all of that stuff they followed an order but they were not a religious order they were more of a militarized order 
or a police hmm. order kind of. So, and that's what the Cobalt Soul is. Um, it was created by Matt Mercer. Um, and <laughs> it is more of a militarized slash. I, I would say it's more of a martial order um, where you don't have to be religious to be a monk. Uh, I had to think about that. Yeah, the, um, the monk is I will a ton use... of fun. I have always, you know, it's funny you mentioned kobolds. I have seen so many discussions about kobolds seem to be like have their own like cult following in D D and D that I've seen. Like people, like it, it seems like when they the concept of them that came out, it almost seemed like, hey, look, let's have some lizard comic reliefs, and yet now there's like, so, so there's there's this thing with kobolds is there's always a kobold, at least one kobold. Or sets of kobolds in every campaign, um, whether it's somebody playing a kobold like we had, or the kobolds that live in the cave with the dragon and bend to the dragon's will, because um, kobolds are supposed to be um, classic kobolds are supposed to be um, servants of dragons. They worship dragons they want to tend to them even though the dragons hate them and they eat them and this and that the cobalt yeah. still do everything for them they help hoard for them and so there's always some cobalt the somewhere Sims of the D D world pretty much i've never really i think you guys may have fought cobalts before we did uh twitch um but other than uh that, yeah remember really... when i start when i started the scarlet brigade saga yeah you guys really haven't Wait touched kobolds that much yeah um, well, I, well I, I guess i don't i don't i don't want to fall uh, into the stigma of the kobolds um kind of thing um you guys have done the stereotypical fight a dragon you've done this now what's up and coming is what i have planned is pretty epic um so but yeah, um, I, uh, what, you know, it's funny. I was just thinking about that. It seems like D and D while they, while they, they add races, it seems like there's just so many other concepts. I, I don't know if they did this deliberately or if it's just something that they just haven't gotten around to. They do, there's just so many different race concepts out there that, I, you just they're not playable like unless again unless i'm i'm just going off the 5e edition what i see on uh D, D beyond i never see like you know a we like a permanent werewolf or wolf-like class or so, with, with or even that, like a tree they have to be very careful uh what they do um because there are some stuff so Remember, I shared that picture of advanced D and D. Um, the AD oh yeah, that that one. So that is the for those that don't know, um, and obviously you guys don't because you're not in our Discord, which will be opening to the public soon once we get enough followers. Um, I shared in our Discord. I went to my local bookstore um, called Half Price Books uh, here in Kentucky, and um. They had in a case in plastic, all of that. Um, they had an original advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And for those that don't know, AD and D is the beginning. It's what was in the 70s and 80s before first edition and everything that we have now. These are the modules that you ran were advanced D. &D. So when advanced D, D came out, they had the orcs um uh the halflings were actually called hobbits um and they got threatened to be sued because the token the people yes yeah. um they had they actually had a lot to do with like they had to be very careful because obviously even before Tolkien, we had we there were stories of orcs and elves and all of that, so they were safe to do that. Um, they had to be very careful of the other stuff that they did, where people were 
loving the Tolkien stuff, so they wanted they wanted a hobbit like creature, but if D and D did hobbits, they were gonna get sued. So that's where we get the halfling. Um so we have I will say not as a playable race, but we have like treants, which are large trees, which yeah. I think I remember I, I, when I was coming up with some stuff, I remember seeing like just briefly, but I thought, eh. So I think the issue, my issue with the treant would be, and a reason that would probably be one that I wouldn't allow if somebody decided that they want to play a treant, because for those that use D&D Beyond, we know that you can do homebrew races, you can do homebrew subclasses, all of that. Um, we've used homebrew stuff. So the reason I wouldn't allow Treant is for ease. That's probably think, really big. Well, Treants are gigantic. They're large. Like, think of a walking, talking oak tree. Um, so try getting into a building with them or <laughs> riding. How are they supposed to get around? They walk very slowly. Um, they can't ride a horse. They can't do any of that. So for, unless you are, your entire session is out in the woods, the treant's useless. You can't do yeah. anything unless oh, I'm just, the, I, the I just DM use that to, as an, the DM would have to come up with, something of a transformation object where he could transform into a smaller tree that can move faster and this and that, um, which is the only way I could see around it. But there, there's a lot that I think they should, that they should do. Um, lucky, lucky for us with D and D beyond, they allow you to create your own races. Um, they allow you to homebrew and, then at that point, it's up to your DM whether you that homebrew is allowed. Um, I have a few concepts for creatures that I'm not going to talk about because they're probably actually they are going to end up in our campaign. Um, <laughs> so just like the the shopkeeper that you guys met on Sunday. Um, it's kind of a mix of a few different creatures that I put together. I'm going to um, tell you, we need to get Elliot on making like a concept art for that. I want to see a visual of what that will look like. I, I think mean, that'd I, look awesome. Elliot's working on a few things for me in secret. So um, that you guys will, uh, Elliot's actually working on a mascot drawing for us. Um, that will be revealed soon once Elliot's done. And I mean, I could definitely do a concept art of, of this. I don't think I have a name for him for this creature yet. Yeah. I had to stew on that. Cause it's, I have a name um, for a shop, but not a name for, um, make sure you make sure we skirt them. Copyright laws. <laughs> Um, the, uh, why did I come up with a name for the shop? I actually came up with it at work yesterday. Something and haggles. Um, but yeah, so, um, I want to kind of go into, obviously anybody that has seen us, Watch this as her reference Critical Role, uh, Matt Mercer, all of them. Obviously, they know that most of us are pretty big fans of Critical Role. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is a subject for every Dungeon Master out there. Is the your players, especially ones that have never played D&D, <laughs> that watch Critical Role. And they watch Matt Mercer DM, one of the greatest DMs in the world, in my opinion. I think he's one of the best, if not the best. Um, whatever your guys' opinion is, is fine. Um, but it, that's my opinion. Um, obviously, his acting experience lends to that. But um, 
you get the players that watch Critical Role through its three seasons now, um, all of its one shots I... and everything, and they <laughs> say, "Oh, I want to play D and D. Let's find a DM. Let's find this and that." And then they expect a Matt Mercer level DM. And that is, I think, well, first off, that is a very unfair, um, that is very unfair to any new D, any other DM, especially a new DM. I mean, you know that, I know that trying to create this stuff, trying to keep pace with everything is, it's very hard. It can be very challenging. Like I, I, I was referencing before. The when the one shot that I wrote that started that kind of kicked off the Scarlet Brigade that Ethan kind of is now helming, which he's doing a very great job at it. Um, I was constantly having to adjust everything because Marish, I didn't, I probably on my part, I should have maybe started you guys on a lower thing because you just started blowing through my. I I remember I'm sitting in my little barrack at army training for um, I, for those of you who don't know I'm in the army national guard and I was away for about a month and a half almost almost going on two months right yeah. about a month month and a half um for uh my MOS training in the army and like Caleb said he just he needed a break that night to catch up on everything for our main session and he's like hey do a one shot got to be done tonight and I was like oh Okay, so like throughout the day when I had time during training, I just came up with I just wrote a one shot. I was like, okay, cool. It was pretty simple, and I, you know, I threw in. I, I had a really lousy internet connection, so he gave me a monster guide, and literally the only thing that was in there was literally everything on the first like four pages of. <laughs> if you actually look at the new at the alphabetical listing of most of this stuff, it's all kind of sequential A B C. And that's the only thing that would go that would load up, but he just he started blowing through, so it was constantly having to keep up. I was like, oh crap, uh, I gotta keep changing the AC and the D and the and the HP for these things because they're gonna it's gonna be done in like five minutes. And I mean, Maresh killed your character. Maresh blew through an Eldritch Abyssal creature, like it was just some punk trying to rob you with a switchblade. I was like, and wow, that's... this thing. And that's one of the things that, so DMs make the best and the worst players. Um, they, DMs always love to take a step back and be able to play. Um, it, it's a nice relief. It's nice to see, not that I don't ever have fun DMing. I love DMing. I love building um, the the world i love seeing you guys react to things in the world uh, especially there's going to be some jaw dropping moments like there was last night or <laughs> sunday night i mean um but to be able to get into somebody else's world and play a character is great it's nice it's relaxing um and so at that point most dun and most dungeon masters they will fine they will wait for everybody else to pick their class and then they will do the fill-in of what's needed because they know how to build a round rounded party um they also make the worst because they know how to build stronger characters to defeat most enemies like i did with maresh i figured out how to make the reason that a goliath barbarian is so common is because the goliaths get their uh, extra strength um so be having them as a barbarian makes more sense um the at that point he was oh i don't even remember what path i chose um i for forget him originally. i don't remember what he's at a different path now but i don't remember what path i chose originally um but I just I was able to build such a strong character because I know the books inside and out. Um and yeah, so that I think good. I think the um a good DM knows how to balance 
to progress the story, but he also knows to let his characters, his players develop in his characters. And he's got to, it's also, I think the best, best way to learn to be a DM also is when you start with a group of no vices like yourself, because I've seen, you see many stories of people who have these great, you know, I've seen on TikTok, there's just, you know, people make little videos highlighting it, you know, they make a DM, the new DM is like, oh, I have this great thing, and they have a bunch of experienced players, and the players are toxic as hell, and they just ruin the experience. Uh, Uh, Funny enough, I just read about that, Um, I have a few... I follow a few groups on Facebook um, that I'm part of. And one of them is a DM that has a group of people. Um, his player is a paladin, I think, um, who just threatens everybody, says that they can and will kill everybody if they get in his way and blah, blah, blah. Um, they There was an NPC that people wanted to capture but he decided to cut the head off so they couldn't revive them and all of that and the the dm was asking what to do because this person's also a family member but he's also toxic and he's been talked to before um and for the dms out there that are dealing with this um i'm not going to go into it but our first session we had our share of toxicity um, and it was handled. Um, but talk to your players. Have a session zero. Um, we didn't really ever have a session zero. I just kind of, uh, for those that don't know, a session zero is where all of you sit down and together as a group, you go through character character concepts. You talk about the background of the world the rules this and that um i will say that when we do campaign two we will have a session zero because it will be a lot bigger um but have a session zero talk to your rules um i have a rule of because i do have some people that do have some D experience i have a rule of no backseat dming this is oh, God. my virtual table um which within the next year will be a real table. Um, especially once Pam and Ben move here. Um, the There's no backseat DMing. My table, my rules. Um, I was actually just talking about this on Facebook, is I follow R- RAW, R-A-W, rules as written for some things. But again, this is, it's your campaign, it's especially if it's homebrewed this is your campaign this is your world this is something you created whatever rules you want create them that's the nice thing about the dungeon master's guide is it's a guide it's supposed to help you especially if you're newer kind of traverse the ways of being a dungeon master and then kind of just let you go and you do what you want i mean there's homebrew rules in every campaign, and we have plenty of our own homebrew rules. We probably have people that are watching um, some of our sessions going, well, that's not in the book. Um, that's not the right role. That's not this. And, well, guess what? It's in mind. So if you're having problems with a toxic player, talk to them. If I I told my players that you will be talked to once if it's not fixed by the next session you're gone and you will never be allowed back i think um, some people t- use D and i understand this i know you've had i know <laughs> um i know there's an incident between you and i when we rp'd way back when we first met i was just having a bad day hey and look who decided this who's Chris. here the Lizard um, of the Hour. I'm just joking. Sorry, Chris. For those of you that don't know, this is Chris, the, who plays Sobek, the White Dragonborn Paladin. Um, Sorry, wait. Chris, what was your first character's name? Um, Avne Anubai. He was a warrior Asimir. I think I pronounced that class right. That's uh, right. Asimir. He was the Asimir fighter, right? 
Yes. That's right. Okay. With the gun that didn't work. Yeah, he was oh, a gun. He was Until a gunslinger. Yeah, that's right. We made him a gunslinger. Okay. We were. We were. Ethan was at when Ethan was on. He was asking about the night that <laughs> Safi died, and I could not remember your your character. Um. But yeah. So again, if you have toxic players, tell them that it's your way or the highway. It's pretty much all there is to it. You're you're here to not only make a memorable game for your people, but to have fun and toxic players kind of sap that fun away. Um, I like to think we all have fun every Sunday. Um, yeah. And obviously, so myself, Ben and Pam have been friends for almost two years now. Um, mm -hmm. We obviously we come from similar backgrounds. We have two sets of players that are married to each other, which helps. We have Chris and Jeannie, um, and we have Ben and Pam, who are married. My dad and I play. I DM. My dad plays. So we have a family dynamic there. And then the right, we're just we're just all good friends. I mean, we started out playing Star Wars: The Old Republic, and we grew into this and left that behind. Um, and we we all kind of meld well together. We have had issues um, where we actually had to sit down and say, okay, what this is the other thing that you need to do with your session zero is what are off limits for your players? What should not be delved into? Um, what is going to trigger people? People have issues People have PTSD. They have past experiences that this may trigger stuff. Um, so we we went into that. We had a list, and everybody got to see everybody's triggers. So it's not just me as a DM saying, okay, I'm not going to write this into the story, but it's everybody in the campaign as a whole saying, okay, we are – Nobody please touch on these subjects because it will trigger somebody and somebody will want to leave. Um, so we conscientiously, um, all eight of us, make sure that we don't touch those topics. Wasn't um, the one incident with my wife on that one battle for real? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and that's really what happened. That was, I think, we weren't televising then. That was actually no. a week before we started streaming. Um, we, I think it was two Yeah, we had a session where we kind of did a forced battle royale where uh, the players weren't going to die permanently, but I didn't tell them that uh, due to surprise reasons. And Genie, Genie wasn't. Comment. Jeannie okay. didn't like that as much, so we had Jeannie sit out um, while everybody played. Um, and then we did delve into what's off limits, what's good. Um, so, and we haven't had any issues since with anybody. Um, no. I mean, at this point, we've had, I've made Jeannie cry a few times in a good way. Um, <laughs> Pam actually was on, on the verge of tears on Sunday. In a good way. My my goal now, for next session, for Sunday session, is to make Pam cry. Just so you know. Oh, please I, don't. I've got to deal with that. I, I have been writing at work, and I know exactly what's going to happen. Depending on what the roles do, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm leaving it up to the dice. But either way, Pam's going to end up crying at the end, by the end of the session. I guarantee it. Well, I got know what i got to do before, <laughs> before that. Um. Get her all her favorite snacks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. We were uh, talking about this before, Chris. So obviously you were, you were running late, which is, which is fine. It's understandable. Um, so I think we'll, we'll ask this just to kind of keep kind of loop back. What would you say? What's your favorite race in D and D? Like what's I know you play, you've played Dragonborn quite a bit, but what else? What, what else? Do you, what else tickles your fancy? Play. The Wood Elf Ranger, the 150 year old Wood Elf Ranger, oh, uh, yeah. Rohan, who was the winner of that arena fight. 
Um, I haven't explored many other races. It'd be I want to dive into more, so that's why one shots are fun. You can dive into a different character. That way, you don't burn yourself out on your current, your main campaign character. Which, which is one of the reasons that we do our one shots. Which, um, just for future reference for anybody that does watch this, we are going to be pre-recording a few one shots. That once we get a a Patreon set up, uh, eventually those will be Patreon unlocks, um, where you guys will be able to see these one shots. Um, but uh, what is a race that you want to delve into? Race that I would want to delve into. Ooh. That'd be interesting. So, now, so, so somehow now I, I don't know much about D D races as these two would know. Something um I will after Ben talk nerd to me. By the way, here's Carl. There's Jeannie. Hey, also Jeannie. known as Bakira, the black dragonborn blood hunter slash were fucking wolf. You also forgot her title, Captain uh, yes. Bakira. Captain Captain Bikira, Leader Suarez. of the Miseries End. I think a were white tiger would be fun. So, there, there is a were tiger. That is a playable race. Um, I'm just finding out about this now. Yeah, there's there's yeah. were tigers, were bears. Um, right I feel like bears. my life. Bears I feel are a playable like, race. I feel like I've been lied to my whole so life. So one of the one of the best things i've seen is a is a play on on a thing um there is there is uh palace and plated in one of critical roles one shots which was the adventures of darrington brigade he played owl bear who was not an owl bear he was a human with owl bear on he basically did kind of what we did on sunday he was batman <laughs> so for those that quickly. okay for those that didn't see on sunday we ethan since argos is off doing his own thing which i know that brought some tears to people's eyes i don't think you guys expected me to have an actual recording to play um i had him record that like two weeks ago um so i wanted to be able to actually play it but um so we had we needed something for Ethan to play since he didn't have a scheduling conflict this Sunday and I didn't want him to sit out. So we were originally going to bring a character in from, well, my original thought was to bring tree back. Um, but then he talked about wanting to play a monk. So I was like, okay, we'll play darling from Scarlet Brigade. Uh, we'll kind of meld the two together because we've already done that before. Um, and then I was like, wait, no, what about a turtle monk? And my concept was the play like Taliesin did with Owlbear was to make a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. With I mean, Grandpa the, Mutant Ninja Turtle? Yeah, without, without actually calling him a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> So we we did the huge. He was, old. he was ancient. He yeah. was an old. And he's probably dead now. Um, to be to be honest, I think I think he's going to have a heart attack Ugh. going through that portal. I think that's how I'm going to kill him off. He's just going to have a heart attack, and he's just going to be there in his shell. Um, and Bakaro's like, well, there goes another one. Yeah. Um, so more rum for Captain Bakira. Um, but yeah, so. Bakira, Genie, what is a race you would like to delve into? Oh, that is a hard one. I because obviously this entire time you've been a fucking actually, dragonborn slash werewolf. I came up with a concept for well, a UNT on honestly. Uh, um, oh, Pamela, love the, that the, the form, <laughs> the form with the serpent tail and the human. Okay. Okay. Now, well, maybe. And I actually, I actually made one on Hero Forge. Maybe uh -huh. when Campaign Two comes out, maybe you'll be able to play that character. 
I was tell I was telling them earlier that I already know I already have my character for so campaign obviously, two. Obviously, I don't <laughs> want to reveal anybody's campaign two characters. Um, like I told everybody watching, campaign two is being written as we speak. I told you guys this Sunday. Um, campaign What's two up, is being Chris? written as we speak, but I don't want to reveal people's characters. I want it to be a surprise as everybody shows up, even to each other. Why do you make a character for that? Not yet. No, I, we're we're still like a year out. Maybe I just ha I created this character as a joke, and then like half the characters I ever created is I just created mine as a joke, and then I was like, and then I just have long days of just thinking. I was like, you know, I can make that work. Okay, so what is? I mean, that's this is this is for each of you. What is a class? That you haven't played yet that you would like to play. What well, if I only did it in a one shot? I really wasn't active too much about it. Any class you want to play? Any class that a class that you would like to delve into long term? A druid. I would actually love to get into the druid more. Okay. I. That. That is, that is an actual tricky one for me because there's like so many classes that I want to play but I think I... <laughs> so everybody has to understand that any everybody in this campaign has played at least two characters to three characters where Bakira has only played one she's yeah. been Bakira you know, this Jeannie, entire time Jeannie you know what's a character you know what's a class I, I want to see you play as at some point a warlock a fighter no a fighter a no, fighter i no. for whatever reason i can just see you going ball to the walls losing your shit and hacking some I, poor cobalt to death just because fuck him that, no, no to be to be honest Barbarian. to be honest i can see genie i can see you playing a wizard yeah i can yeah. See, like a hermit crazy wizard that you piss him off or her off and they just unload this barrage of fireballs. I know where my snake lady's going to be now. There Thank you. you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I know where my snake and of course, is. as we delve, as we delve into that, then you get into, of course, what subclass are they going to be in wizard? Because you have, you have all right. of, you have so many different types. You you have a melee wizard who is who does the dancing blades. Um, yeah, the spell sword, right? Yeah, basically, well, yeah. Um, to be honest, th this character that I created, the Yuan Chi with, with the serpent tail and the human over hat, um, was a one-time character for a different D and D group. Um. Before we started all this. Um, and she was a sorcerer. <laughs> her, her, the, the, I had fun with her as a sorcerer. Because I had Misty Step with her. So. Giant 15 foot <laughs> long snake with Misty Step. So speaking, speaking of I sorcerer. Speaking of sorcerer. We're going to go back a little bit. Because Ethan. Uh, when Ethan was in here at the beginning and was asking, because we were talking about uh, one of his character concepts he wants to play as a tiefling. While well, we were talking about the tiefling that we had, Safi. And then mm -hmm. we were talking about yeah. the death of Safi. Um, so I explained and went back in time and told him how Safi died. So... Genie, oh, how does it feel to be the only remaining member of the original Misery's End? Now, I'm, um, I'm asking from your point of view as Genie and also Bakira's point of view. Well, from my point of view, I'm kind of like, how the fuck did I survive all that shit? Uh, I, 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 gave this, I gave this away earlier, <laughs> but you should have. I actually backed off. I had another. I had another power word kill that I was going to kill you with, and I decided not to do it. So, it's just yeah, something so about Bakira we like. Like running gag again of 
Hey, you almost killed Captain Bajira Duran. You know what? I actually, you know what? I, I am enjoying it to the fullest extent because it's just like it's giving my character that much depth. It's giving my mm -hmm. character that much to go on. It's developing her in a way that I had hoped to be able to develop her because. When I started this, I had no fucking clue what I was doing. Um, mm, nobody like, did. None. Yeah. So, I, I was, so what? What so about the I development? Came up with a what about the development when I put Safi back in the story? Uh, which was off the top of my head, by now. the way. It was off the top of my head, by the way. I'll just leave that there. Oh man! Oh man! Yeah, no. From Bakira's standpoint, she is. An emotional wreck right now. Not gonna lie. Let's be honest, she Jeannie was an emotional wreck that night too. I I was. I, <laughs> I absolutely was. Um, but from my character standpoint, she's an emotional wreck, but because of her being dragonborn and being raised by mercenaries, she's learned how to hide away her emotions and seek it out from the bottom of a bar a bottle. So she's become a drunkard. Um, but at the same time, I can see this really pushing my character to acknowledge her feelings in a way she never did in the past. And I want that for her. I want her to be have to have her feelings ripped out from her and shown to everybody. Because in my mind, the way she's going, she's headlong to her death right now. That's her mentality is I'm the last surviving member of the original group. I somehow am Fucking in charge of these lunatics. <laughs> Especially me. It's their lunatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I have no fucking clue what I was doing. Yes, I was being groomed to be a potential leader for my werewolf mercenary clan. Which, but if, you, if you haven't watched, surprise, I, uh, werewolf. I, <laughs> yeah, which. I cut, I cut and ran the moment shit got hard. I can't do that here because it's a bit more personal. Mm -hmm. And she is going through some shit with that because she's like, I've cut and run before. What makes me think I won't do that now? And I want her to I'll be honest with you, DM. I want her to come to that face to face. I want her to face that. Oh, it's planned. So, Flair, I want her to face that. I want to. I want to ask you if you could bring back, whether it's you or Bakira, um, if you could bring back any one of the original members. Who would you bring back? And just because your husband's sitting there doesn't mean you have to say his. No, no. Actually, actually, she wasn't as Bakira. Bakira wasn't actually close with husband's original character. But the closest that she was to was Safi and Finch. Those were the two that <laughs> she ended up being close to. Yeah. It was Pam's but, psycho character. But, but again... Safi was like, you know, little sister. Yeah. She, she looked at Sinj as a little sister and it's like, hey, I, I could teach this kid some shit. You know? I, and Safi, Safi, you know, she she was good and pure and you know, she was kind of the reason why Bakira honestly kept with Misery's End because 
she saw that light from a noble tiefling that didn't really know much about the world, but still, you know, saw good in it. And she appreciated the fact that there was somebody out there that could. And that showed her that there were still people out there that could see the good. And that's why having Safi's soul back is so fucking with her and because she saw I'm that just glad you didn't want to bring and it's back. back. And, and Safi's parents still don't know she's dead. Cause you guys never <laughs> told her <laughs> like two years later, <laughs> this is like two to three years later. No clue. No, no clue. clue. They think Safi's just. I, I'm just. I'm still. just. I'm just glad you all don't want to bring Salik back because yeah, I. Birdman. Bird, Bird, Birdman needs to stay buried in. So where, wherever that happened for, to him, he needs me, to stay there. If I could bring back any character throughout the entire campaign, it would probably be probably be Elliot's second character. Yes. Yes. Their second character her. was amazing. I. I'm yeah. sad that I killed them but that it was the roles um but that was that um, was probably the best character i like willow don't get me wrong i like willow, I love willow. but I, I think the accent the attitude everything of elliot's second character was great and even elliot said on sunday that they missed that character i'd uh i'd actually like to bring I'll, Ronan, Ro- I'll, I'll be honest i as, as a player i miss that character too but Neat. again i, I that was also at a time, from Bakira's standpoint, at a time where she was very much trying to pull herself away from the group. Because, again, she saw it as, who's going to die next? Who's going to be the next one to die? Yeah. So she was trying not to get close to anyone. Which, you know, having Safi's soul back, someone that she was close to in the original group is bringing her back out of that mentality to where she is starting to actually care about the group around her again. So this, obviously, this is changing a lot more from um, our normal talk nerdy to me to being more of a behind the curtains, which I believe gives us a new concept for a show. Um, yeah. Instead of talk nerdy to me, maybe we go behind the curtain and we talk about the campaign and the characters okay. and get some of the characters in here to talk. Um, so. I tell you this though, one character I'd like to come back from our original casting, Rowan. I like I I was sa- I, that was like no Rowan. Oh, God. I loved Rowan, and then I saw it when he just nobly sacrificed himself, and then I'm just like. No! He was my second character, and he was the one since the original. I, I still bring him I, back. I set, I set you up for that one. I really did. I know you I did. Mean, to, be, you to be honest, my, my plan was to make everybody stay. To see how many people I could get to stay. I thought I was going to have Bakira. I was this close to getting Bakira to stay. You I was are. this close. But I, I like that... To be honest, I like that we only have one of the original. Although, of course, everybody likes having these long-running characters and everything like that, like Critical Role does, where we had in Campaign 2, we had the same characters the entire time except for Molly Mock, who dies, and then they bring in a new character. But um, I like because... I can develop a lot more stuff for Bakira solely with like I did with Safi and the nod, the nod back to Safi, which if you guys haven't watched that episode, go watch it. Um, I forget what episode it is, but it was amazing to watch Bakira to watch Jeannie's jaw drop and tears start to come. It was great. Um, that as a DM, that's one of the greatest feelings. I've told you guys this before. It's one of the greatest feelings to see tears. And it's not that we we're here to make you cry and make you miserable. It's I, as a DM, my goal for this was to build a world that you guys can be so involved in that you feel it in real life. Like you are you do with Bakira. You f- you're feeling all these things. I'm going to bring Safi back. Um, 
like last Sunday when we went into the Fay Wilds and Pam started to get emotional because she sees her twin sister. That that as a DM is what you long for is and I'll be honest, the my main goal is at the end of this campaign, with whether it's three months, six months, whatever it is, is the very last session for and we've talked about this for those that don't know, we've talked about our very last session, everybody coming to Kentucky. Um and us for our very last session doing our very first in-person session um, as our last session. But my goal for the last session is for everybody to be in tears because the sessions, the campaign's over and that chapter's closed. Cause obviously this campaign's important to us because this is the start of dungeons and magi. We are, we started our business because of this campaign and obviously we have everybody that's in the campaign as a founder. Um, of Dungeons and Magi and it's important to most, if not all of us. Um, but so obviously this is going to be a special campaign, but what I'm building for campaign two, I haven't even gotten to the story yet. I I'm just building the world right now. I'm not, to be honest, I'm not building a story for another six months while I'm building these small towns and these villages and stuff like that. But I know what I have planned for. I know how I'm ending campaign one. I'll just say that. That's already the ball has already rolled with that. I will say. Ooh. You guys have already seen a glimpse of the end. <clears throat> now I'll tell you this, Caleb. Now that we've again spoiler for everyone. Now that we're in the Fey Wilds, I'm going to tell you from Belvis's point of view. He's going to be very excited because Belvis is a is he's he's one of those wandering like he grew up hearing all those adventures in the Western Seas amongst his people. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna get. Once he was he got the ability to get out of the water and just start traveling the land and everything. He's like, I'm gonna be an adventurer. And he you know he's gone everywhere fighting, you know, earning money and trying to get the glory, but he never could get. He's not magical, so he's there's. Never can get to the Fey Wilds. So the idea of going to this hidden magical realm full of like some of the beasties of legend and stuff, he's just gonna be like, I'm in. I am in. Let's do this. He's gonna he's just probably just gonna be running around swinging his his two short stores trying to kill everything just so that he could, you know, say that he did it. Well, you guys are definitely you guys leash are, on him. There's been she. You're, She's gonna you're, have to straight up like definitely facing facing yep. a few things depending depending on what happens discussion wise and role wise. You guys may face a few things in the Fey Wilds, or you could turn right around and leave. Um, I have a feeling no, hey, though. Man. I have a feeling though that Lily's not gonna let you guys just turn around and leave. Um, yeah. really, what? And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but what I try and do for each session is give a little focus on each character. We had our one session where it was all Bakira, <laughs> where we faced her old clan and we got to, we did the big reveal of her being a werewolf, which shocked <laughs> everybody. Yeah. Um, especially because blood hunters typically aren't werewolves. Um, Aside from Dragonborn, aren't aren't usually werewolves. Aside from Chetney, right now, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I try it. I've been trying to kind of, and obviously Argos has his whole own thing going on right now on Wednesday, on every other Wednesday, um, where he's kind of delving into that. Which I don't. You guys haven't seen it, have you? No, I haven't yet. Okay. Mate, oh. I mean, if if you want to be completely surprised, then don't watch it at all. And just wait till it comes back to session, because Ben Ben oh, watched I, it. Ben watched it. So that, that's kind of what I'm going for, because that'll help me as a character. new person D D help me as keep so back yeah. surprised as well. Yeah, I mean that that's perfectly fine. If you guys don't want to watch it so you can be more surprised, then I'm all for it. Ben Ben was there watching it live. So he knows what happened. Um, and boy, is it going to be a big surprise to the rest of the group. So I want to ask you guys this. This is directed to you. So since I know you, you guys have had some experience with D&D, 
to you what is a little bit you're right but you we've but rp wise we've had, we've obviously rp'd other games and stuff and so you have the concept of you know so to you what do you think makes a good dm someone who's or just or, or to use a uh not to just focus someone who's running a, a an rp session just to get even more broader GM, GM, what do you whatever yeah you whatever what do you what do you think is a good one because we were talking about this earlier where caleb thinks matt messer is probably god level tier uh in terms of dms matt just messer because he's the greatest a, dms in the world probably he probably is i've seen the stuff it's great i've seen others that are just as great they're in my opinion are just as great but there's obviously people who think he set the bar too high, and then there because then everybody just keeps falling short. Well, I, and this, and wanna, this, and that. I want to kind of put a disclaimer out there. For me, I started watching Critical Role at a really tough time in my life, where my PTSD was getting the better of me. My, I'll I'll be completely honest, suicide depression was getting the better of me, and I really delved into Critical Role. And Critical Role literally saved my life. So I I have a very special place in my heart for Critical Role, for Matt Mercer, for everybody. But so that's – and of course, that aside, he's still an amazing DM. But that's why I think Matt Mercer is so good because he just – he hit me at a time where I needed that part most. So back to my original thing, just not to not to cut you off, Caleb. I'm just saying, what do you guys look think is it what makes a good DM? And and again, I'm you know don't worry about that. Our actual DM is right there. You know, just ignore him. I'm not well, here. he's he's been my only DM. I'm not Let's put here. it that way. Um, <laughs> so it's something actually I love that he does, and I'll put Joel on the spot here. Is he gets to know his characters. He has his own little side chats where he wants answers from us so he can build it he wants to get to know us as people but also as characters so that he can develop the story but also make it so we're all interactive and then some days yes i'm pretty sure you all see me hold back a little bit because that's in the time sobek sobek is here because um he was doing it for rohan rohan had asked sobek to be here and still to what he got it so Sobek keeps to himself. No one's really got him to really open up. I'm sure Joel's working on that. I'm sure other people are kind of wanting to work on that. Argos was working on that. I will put that out. Argos is about the closest one to get uh, Sobek to open up. So I, I will I will say with, with that, I typically will never write in something to lead your characters to do something. Um, like spilling their secrets and this and that i won't ever write in there to lead into that i will let you guys take that rope hand me that rope and then i'll just run with it like i do for for those that don't know if you ever look at my notes you will see that it's mostly bullet points for a few things and i make everything else off off the top of my head um for pretty much all our sessions especially this last sunday um, but Jeannie can answer. Hmm? Your you, turn to ask. Him. You, you, no, you can, you can answer, uh, Ben's question. What um, you think makes a good DM? Uh, uh, someone who actually, well, like husband said, someone who gets to know not only the players and how to interact with the players, but somebody who knows how to bring out the character from the player. And you have done an awesome job of that. Honestly, you have. And it has been an absolute blast to do this. And it's made me want to explore the world of D&D to a greater extent. And I appreciate that hella a lot because it's just like you've opened up. I've always had a active imagination. Um, 
it was an escape for me growing up. Um, I'd build worlds in my head, characters, and all that, um, because it was an escape from kind of a rough childhood. To be able to bring that out into a reality with other people has been one of the best experiences of my life. Um, and it's amazing. I, I love it. And, you know, having people that are like-minded that, you know, I can be friends with and have fun creating these stories, these worlds, these people, and them. A good DM knows how to bring that out of people, and it's amazing. Uh, seeing that makes you excited to when the DM gets to your character, see what he does with your character, and bring it out. So one, oh, one of the things no. I try and do is um, obviously I kind of showed it in the in the Twitch is um, we have a chat channel for each character. It is separate from everybody else. It is just between myself and that character. It is where we discuss their character. And sometimes I'm annoying with how many questions I ask them. Um, Bakira mostly has been the one I've been delving into the most um, just because of being the impromptu leader and the original member and this and that I've really delved into Bakira and I know Bakira will let me delve into that background a lot more. Same thing with Ethan. And obviously everybody's pretty open, but so with, with Bakira, I know I can delve into a bigger, broader backstory and Bakira knows how to run with it. With Ethan, I can bring up the dumbest fucking concepts the most ridiculous thing like Picasso and <laughs> he will do it. No questions asked. He is, <clears throat> he is my version of Matt Mercer's Taliesin Jaffe, where Taliesin just does whatever Matt asks. No questions asked. If you notice every campaign, Taliesin has always had some type of homebrew something where <clears throat> that's what I do with Ethan. Um, but go ahead then. Um, one thing that now I and I agree with with uh, what you said about that is what a good DM will do. Now on the same flip, uh, on the other side of that coin, to me, we got if we're talking about the good, we got to talk about the bad because we were kind of touching on this before um, about tox toxicity in sessions. And it can be bad. We've we've had us ourselves. We have had that experience, albeit maybe if not you, as bad if you as all others go back have. To the very first session, you will remember. Yeah. So to me, for a DM now, th and this is something that I've noticed, and usually it's a it's usually spun as a, in the form of a gag, but I think uh, I think brand new DMs fall into this trap a lot. Is I must kill my my players now we we all again we all know from firsthand hey that happens poor safi <laughs> you know except literally hmm? except for this one yeah, yeah, for yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> but it, it can happen but i've seen it where there's literally some d first time dms even even normal dms um uh, they will be very. They will either be very close-minded on what they want in there. I think I saw. Uh, I think Caleb, I showed it to you, or it was something else where uh, somebody was like online recruiting, putting an ad for it to start a D and D campaign, yes. and he wanted he wanted all females and only experienced. Uh, um, yeah, so, and I'll say from a DM's perspective, what that is, is, that's a fetish, first of all. 
um, w- that we won't get into. That I I know from I know that if he wants not all that fem- kind of a discussion. <laughs> if he wants all females, and it's for a reason. Um, but I will say that that whole because obviously there's a whole thing of the DM is God, and in these worlds he is. I mean. But one of the things, and I actually have this written on my desk on a post-it note at work, um, and it says, you can prepare all you want, but you will never be in control. Um, and that's the thing. As a DM, I can, I can spend the, – the rule, the rule used to be for every hour of a session, there's an hour of preparation before. Um, now it's about for every hour, it's two hours of preparation because of all the digital content and this and that. And, um, I, I found when we first started this, I found that I prepped a lot. I was prepping for four five, six hours for a three hour session. I don't do that anymore. I prep half an hour. Um, I, I write on Wednesdays. So like when we get off of here tonight, I will write for Sunday and then Sunday, um, Sunday's the day my dad comes, comes over. He and I hang out. We go out to lunch, all of that stuff. Uh, we work on dice, which here are guys as dice will be here Sunday and ready to go out. Um, <laughs> so I will send them out next week. Um, so, um, but I I found that the less I prepare, the better I do, as weird as that sounds. Um, I, it may be my theater background. I, for those that don't know, I, when I was in high school and college, I went to school for musical theater and I was a musical theater major and um, dance theater, everything you can think of. Um, so my, that background, I, and better thinking of stuff off the cuff. Um, I like to now like these these little story hooks. I do write ahead of time, but other than that, everything is off the cuff, and I make it up as I go. Most of most of these big jaw dropping moments that you guys have had in our campaign, I made up on the spot, um, based off of your roles and this and that, and then I have to write it down to like Daisy. Daisy wasn't planned. Daisy was not planned at all. There was not supposed to be anything in there, <laughs> but our guys wanted to keep busting through fucking boxes. And I was like, fuck, well, I want, I want something to happen for him busting through these boxes. So then he gets poisoned. Well, but where'd the poison come from? Because these boxes are old. There shouldn't be a trap here. And I was like, there's a fucking plant. Okay, we'll it talks. We'll just go with this plant and it's alive and it was scared so it like sneezed at him and and then it it has its own emotions. We adopt, and, and, and we adopted Daisy. And now you guys have fucking Daisy. Hopefully no fireballs go off near her. <laughs> I'm sure Daisy's going to stay on the boat where it's nice and safe. Um Ish. But, do we have on that boat now? We've got we got we've got two cats. One of them wasn't originally a cat. We have uh we got the war duck uh uh George. And huh? Five packs. Got my tiger. Yeah. Got a it's, dog. A, it's a zoo there. It's a z- <laughs> this is this Where is turning into cone. The baby fairy dragon. Was that a thing? Yeah. Yeah. Guess, but you guys lost show. it. You guys lost it. <laughs> yeah, remember you guys went into the Belbanir Grove and you you were gifted a a fairy dragon by the fairies for helping them. That right, you guys yeah, were yeah, supposed to train. You guys were supposed to train it, it was supposed to grow. Nobody remembered it, and it's dead now. Well, we'll just say it ran away. Oh no, it's dead now. Oh, thank you. you you're a cruel it, man. It got, I will say, you guys brought it to the kingdom with you, and you didn't grab it when the werewolves attacked, and the were- one of the werewolves ate it. So, um, so the whole going to the whole thing, the TPK. I could have TPK'd you guys. 
when the night everybody died, except for Bakira. Like I said, I held off. I backed off. I had another spell slot. I was like, going to allow me to do power word kill, which is what I did on everybody. Um, but I backed it off because I didn't want to follow that. Um, I think a good DM knows that balance of the roles happen. I, and I'll, I'll admit this for every DM, every DM does it. So if you're a DM and you tell me you don't do it, you're a fucking liar. Um, every DM fudges roles to save their players. Um, I will tell you, I have had some natural twenties that I've rolled to attack you guys when you're at low health. And I've called them as misses because I didn't want to kill you guys. Um, especially Bakira. Cause now Bakira is the one I save the most. I, <laughs> I do attack her, but I try not to kill her. Um, just because now I'm so invested in this character, I've built so much backstory into this character that I don't want to waste it. Um, but I I think a DM needs to find a balance of letting letting the roles do what they're gonna do, but also creating a good story. If the roles show a TPK every single session because it can happen the roles are shitty for your players and good for the dm it can happen but if that's going to ruin the story then what's the point of even having a campaign you might as well just do a bunch of pre-written one shots and it's so you gotta kind of find that that balance in between there um of and what what you're what the dice say versus what the story says, especially for us now that we're streaming and showing this to the world, we have to watch that story. I guarantee you people like Matt Mercer, Brandon Lee Mulligan, who runs dimension 20, they all fudge their roles too, whether you see it or not, because they've got their DM screens, which I'm investing in. I will be having DM screen, even though it doesn't matter that much, but, um i think I also yeah 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 um i think also another thing that i think people don't we 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 do obviously it's important for dms and potential dms to make sure that they do make sure they strive for that balance but i think it's also very important for players to do that as well like i'll give you an example this is before we caleb and i even knew you guys when I first started learning how to RP, which would eventually roll into D and D, um, God, I think I was still working in my old job, Caleb. Yeah. I was just having a bad day, I, I, and I was teaching. I I taught him and Pam both how to RP in Star Wars. Yeah. Wars. And one day he, we were in that little RP group that we started with in Star Wars Old Republic, and I was just coming on. He's like, "Hey, do you want to RP? I know you said you're having a bad day." I'm like, "You know what? Yes, yes. I want. I'm having a bad freaking day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this." So we're just doing this regular thing, and it's supposed to be just a benign, fairly benign kind of thing. It was some force ability. I forget what it was called. But you're, it was supposed to just I was supposed to was supposed to just slightly discomfort Caleb's character and then amplify and decrease the pain. No, no, I was having a bad day, so I just had my character RP doing a little and snapped his arm and clean in half. And then proceeded to do the R yeah, you it was And he got even he that for it. Yeah, I, I, well, at, I got that, but I, I got, got I was got everybody was it. yeah because everyone was like uh you okay and I just was like no I'm not having blah 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 and I and then I got a little defensive because I was like what it's RP we're supposed to we're pretending it's not like I actually you know at the time I think you were living in Florida I said yeah. I even told I think it was Tyler I said well, what it's not like I actually drove down to Florida and broke his arm so what's the big deal and then there were I got told by Caleb and Tyler one of the few things he ever that guy ever you know agreed gave yeah. wisdom he's like you need to calm down because this is not healthy and and I and yeah I mean 
so and as a player obviously we all go through stuff in real life um on a weekly basis and yeah i mean you guys just moved um it's stressful that's why we did the one shot the week before so that you guys had time to move um and we didn't want you guys to miss the session especially now that we're rolling into a new story arc and all of that um my stuff's still not here and, really uh, seriously um it, so this was today was supposed to be the soonest this was supposed to be the soonest day so any it any day after this it it could arrive like any yeah. day now um, so, so I, what, what people need to be careful of is this number one, this is a game. First of all, I mean, at the end of the day, whether, no matter how much we're invested, obviously we're building a business out of this, but at the end of the day, it's a game. It can always be gone. It's all it is, is paper and dice. Um, but we need to remember that this is also an escape for people. I know this is still my escape as a DM. This is still my escape. So what people need to do is when they sit down and obviously our intro is uh, dungeons and magi, where we open our books, um, grab our dice, all of that. When we sit there and we open our books, we open D and D beyond, we get behind the camera all of that stuff needs to go away and in, in military and law enforcement, for those that don't know, I spent nine years in law enforcement, including my military time. Um, you have to learn how to put this wall up so that you don't bring your work home with you. Well, this is the opposite And here. You don't want to bring your home to work. Um, you're in this fantasy world that sometimes can feel a little too real. And you want to make sure that every, it's not only up to the DM to make sure that the players are having fun, but it's up to the players to make sure the players are having fun. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I've seen, and I, I, I've seen it on social media, specifically TikTok, where they will like on D and D TikTok, where they'll talk about brand new DMs showing up and they get a session full of toxic players who want, who are, very committed to how they want their characters to develop, Co you know, damn the consequences, come hell a high water, and they make the they make a session which is supposed to be fun into a living nightmare to the point where it, you know some people will just never DM again. I mean, good lord! I mean, going back to Star Wars, there there were times when I would run a session that we would be doing and depending on who we had in that session that I'm night, I would just a name in case they're watching, but you're, you know you're right. You but are. yeah, Starts I would just be, at the, and it's just, uh, anyway, I would just, <laughs> I would just, at the end of it, I would just, I, I almost thought, had to stop myself from throwing things across and to be like, never. I think I at least said three times, say, never again, never again will I do this because I am sick to death of, you know, inattentiveness. I'm sick of the stubbornness and the arguing and the constant questioning. It's like, you know, there, there has to be a time where you just have to be like, shut up and roll with it. And I think that's a, I think players have to realize that. And I think sometimes the worst thing that can happen, it could be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing. If you get a really very long experienced player who only does, who really mostly does the, the established stories in D and D like the, like the actual written modules or the homebrew is so close that you they you know they could have been written by the actual D and D official writers. They start backseat DMing. They start throwing their two cents in. It's 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 oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah. I think as a player, you do have to eventually just listen to the DM and just roll with it. And it, it, like to me, like for, if with Bakira for your character, I I. I I will, I, my character would probably, you know, jump in front of whatever and for, for you. I mean, at this point, I'm like, you know what? We got to keep the care alive. 
Um, Even out of character, I'd be like, "We got to keep Akira alive." And I, I will say that <laughs> I, I've had, I've had some people, some of my players message me, and um, and they'll ask, "Hey, am I being too, like, am I being too showboatish, or is this session too much about me? Do I need to back off a little bit?" And I, I think. In my opinion, as a DM, I think we have a good cast here. We have good players. Um, for the most part, you guys listen to me. You guys may question some of the things, but if I say, no, this is how it is, Ben especially will question me sometimes. Um, do it in private. So, I, I've never he'll, questioned he'll, you in a session. He'll, never. He'll, I will he'll, never question you in a session. Ben will say, hey, I thought it should it should do this. And then I'll explain to you guys well this is why this didn't happen because of this and this and prime example ben i'm sure you don't care um no we i don't were ta- we were talking about the kraken that you guys were fighting <laughs> well, well i got kraken, eaten the kraken swallowed ben well ben thought that he should be able to hack and slash his way out of the inside so i'll be at a disadvantage i i did say i was like i understand i'm in the i've, I've literally been eaten by a monster so, so obviously i'm not going to be fighting on you know advantage there but i thought well i still got my swords and stuff i should be able to jab it from the inside at least so then i explained to him that in D D wise and D rules you got to think that you're inside this monster's intestines that or whatever the throat whatever a very small space that you're not going to be able to move um yeah and now if it were a bigger animal like a whale if you got swallowed by a whale of course i'm gonna let you hack and slash your way out of there um at disadvantage of course but if you get swallowed by a whale a whale has a big body even if you get swallowed they have a big body so but this kraken has it constricts as it swallows, and that's why I didn't allow it. And as soon as I told Ben the reason, he said, "Oh, okay, that I get it now." Um, and and that's the yeah. thing, like especially when you have new players, like we have, a lot of players will have questions of why didn't this happen, or why did this happen, or why did this happen. As a DM, you have to remember, especially if you're an experienced DM, which I'm not at all. I'm not an experienced DM at all. Um, but as an experienced DM especially you have to think that these players don't have as much experience as you. So you have to take a step back, get into their shoes and remember that they're learning along with you. Just think about our, our one shot, our wild west one shot that you guys have not joined yet, but soon Um, our wild west one shot. That's a, that's a completely, yes, you do. Uh, We'll, we'll do that before the end of the month. Um, that's a completely new concept because I created this entire system. Um, so everybody's learning through the system, but so you gotta kind of take a step back and say, okay, they're learning. Um, instead of getting aggravated with your players, you have to, you have to understand that this is not only can a DM teach you, but a DM can also learn from you. Um, one of the things that I that I tell you guys is if you like something, let me know. If you don't like it, let me know. Because then I can adjust how I DM. I can adjust what is being put in the writing. If there's a encounter that's too easy for you, tell me, hey, this is too easy. Now I'm not going to go from a super easy encounter to you facing Tiamat like that. But I'm going <laughs> to gradually increase it. To where you guys feel like, okay, this is a comfortable, like, because you don't want a fight where you can just blow through everybody. It's not fun. You want that fight where it's a, oh, am I going to die? Nope. Let's let the cleric, cleric heal. Let's, and every, every class has their moments where they can shine throughout this fight. Um, and there is that risk of, am I going to die in this session? Um, and obviously I always tease you guys and I mess with you guys that, Oh, you guys are going to die this session, blah, blah, blah. Um, but so the, the DM learns from the players too. Cause again, the, the DM isn't always, doesn't always get to play. They're usually forever DM. What's up, Chris? So question for you and Ben, basically with me being a new player, what would you say I could do better than? 
Um, I'll say from a DM standpoint. Um, and obviously anything I say to you guys is all constructive criticism. Um, I'm oh, not yeah. saying this to put anybody down, anything like that. I will say as a DM and as a group in a whole, I feel number one, I have chaotic players in, in <laughs> that are the game is very chaotic, which I'm, I'm fine with. But you guys also have to learn the balance of letting other characters, players do something. Um, I'll say that each each of you have done it to an extent of, well, this player wants to go and do this, but you go and stop them from doing it. I, at that point, typically when you guys do that, I make you guys roll for it to see, to do the contest. Like when you and Belvis were f- slapping each other to get the guard, <laughs> guard's attention, I made you guys roll for it instead of just doing the, doing the slaps. I made you guys roll for it, um, but they caught on him while I was Bobby. But, but try, it, it, yeah, and then it turned out now we didn't need to do it. Oh, now no. now one one of the things that as a DM you have to learn to do is to let your players run with the story. This is your guys' story, but you all you guys also have to remember as players, it's not just your story; it's the player next to you's story too. So sometimes instead of if um, and I'll say one specific thing um, with you, Chris, is our guys, there, it's mostly been our guys that you stop. And although our guys is the most chaotic one there, I get why you try and stop him. But think about it from if you let our guys go do this thing. Now you can say, hey, don't do this. And let's see if he listens to you. If not, let him go. He ignores you, whatever. If you let him go do that, this, whatever he's doing, may make for another part of the story that you can then play on. Like, he stole something. You as a paladin, whether you're chaotic or not, you as a paladin, you have morals. He is a barbarian who worshiped Baphomet. Your morals aren't going to be the same. So (laughs) you telling him to stop doing something then he ignores you and keeps going to go do this. Obviously you guys talk to him all the time about not taking the deck of many things. That's just become a gag at this point. And it is, of course it's a, it's a thing. And none of you have really physically, although actually you did, you did try and take the deck from him. You, I did. So now think about this. If instead of t- physically taking the deck, you can say, Hey, Maybe you shouldn't use that. If he ignores you, uses the deck, whether it's good or bad comes out of it, you can say, hey, I warned you not to use the deck. Look what happened. And maybe his character comes back to think, well, maybe I should listen to Sobek next time. So you got you got to kind of think, instead of completely stopping a character, you can tell them to stop or say, hey, I suggest not doing this. Let them play that out and see what other... And as a DM, I may be, able, may be able to play on that fact. Like, I'm not going to ruin anything that happened in Argos' stuff, but I have played on the deck of many things in his private session. So you gotta, I, you just got to kind of figure out that, again, these players, they're players too, so you got to kind of let them do their thing as well. I will say there's one thing that I remember that I, I wish I had gotten to do it, but at the same time, for two reasons, I'm glad it didn't happen. Be- for one is because I knew you hadn't <laughs> planned it, Caleb. So I I knew I would have thrown you. I'm I don't want to interrupt, but listen, do not worry about if I've planned it or not. Like I said, I make almost everything up. So if you want to do so, something, fucking do it. I will make it up as I go. So and also, I felt I also looking bad. Thought it would have been like me my character stealing the spotlight and I I'm trying I I, I don't know I, I feel very weird when I get in the spotlight the, which is funny because I'm I'm an only child so the stereotype is that I always want the spotlight in this case I really don't um 
only child as well, and my character got thrown into the spotlight as being <laughs> captain. <laughs> so when we when we were leaving the main part of Telmar, when the that horde of werewolves started overrunning the town, and basically that's where Tree went bye bye. Yeah. Um, there was a part where I realized I thought. Oh, I have a great idea. I Belvis was going to be like, "Hi, oh, you over here, over here, you magic mutts. And then they were all the horde of basically the horde of of werewolves was going to chase Belvis through another part of town while every, while you guys all got away, got the stuff, and got to the ship. And there would be like this epic foot chase scene of Belvis running through the town, darting back and forth, and doing all the stuff. And I could tell. I, I, I just got the idea, Caleb. You just wanted us to escape and get on the ship and start sailing so, as opposed to staying here. So I thought, nah, never mind. And, I, and then I got scared. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm a, a horde of a werewolves chasing me. This isn't going to work out too well. So the, the reason I pushed for that and the reason I wrote that part was like we touched on before. When I wrote Talamar, again, I was – I'm a I'm a new DM. This is my first homebrew. Um, we ran through it very quickly. You guys at that point had hit every part of Talamar that you could. You guys leveled up very quickly. Um, I was leveling you guys up every session. So at that point, we were it, leveling you up every session. Twenty weeks campaigns done. Yes. So, as you can see, why I've slowed it down a lot more. But you, I wrote that part, and I wrote the horde of werewolves because I knew you guys wouldn't be stupid enough to fight them. And if you did fight them, you would all die. First of all, because <laughs> there's yeah. there about fifty of them. If you guys would have stopped the of- fight, there was fifty that I had planned out. That would have been that would have been suicide. And there was three alphas. Yeah. Um, mercenary company of werewolves. Yeah. So that's not a smart thing to that, say. That put you onto the ship to put you in the new world that I wanted you guys in where we're at now. Um so yeah. that that's the reason I did that. I I would have figured if you would have done that, I would have figured out a way to get you guys to that place sooner what probably would have happened they would have escaped belvis you would have died so you so even if i had done the foot chase me trying to run through the town and and like duel you would have been rolling at disadvantage for everything because let's face it you're a fish running through town being chased by a bunch of dogs basically who are good on four legs and who can smell you a mile away yeah, that's what that's that's what I thought. So, yeah, like, you would have been going be at disadvantage, and eventually you would have been caught. You would have died. Um, more than likely, you or you would have had to single handedly fight twenty werewolves. Now, listen, I'll be the first to admit that I got extremely lucky with the rolls when I created Belvis, and you were there, Caleb, when I created this character. I needed you. I actually had to call him in to and live stream it. <laughs> Because I was getting, I got nothing below. I got straight eighteens. Yeah, like every every roll was an eighteen. I was like, I was like, get on here. He's like, well, I'm busy. Like, no, stop what you're doing. Get on here. And he's and I was like, what? I was like, I've been rolling eighteens. You need to witness this, so that nobody accuses me ever of cheating. Because nobody nobody rolls as good on stats, especially on D and D Beyond. And I did. So uh, that's why I really am paranoid with Belvis because it's like I'm never going to get a character this good ever again with these good of a stat rolls. So, um, <laughs> with that being said, um, I want to thank Chris and Jeannie for joining us. Um, thank you, Ethan, for joining us earlier, um, although he had some stuff he had to do. Um, as I said before, this is the end. This is the final episode of talk nerdy to me, but I 
feel like we came up with a new show concept that hopefully everybody can start joining us for, especially now that you guys are moved um, and are moving in. Hopefully Wednesdays will start to, you guys can join us, whether it, even if it's late, like it was. Um, <coughs> but I think we're going to start doing another show first Wednesday of every month behind the curtain. Um, so join us next time. Um, the first Wednesday of every month as we dive into the books, we set aside the dice and we pull back the curtains. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.